Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you all for being here. We have a forum. I can just tell the other two are filled. This is fantastic. Mostly on time. Mike, how are you feeling? Um, I'm okay. Looks good. Looks good. I'm glad you made it too. Thanks. I go by Michael just for this. Sorry, Michael. Sorry. No problem. I have a Michael. My son's name is Michael. I call him. Sometimes he wants Michael. Oh, big deal. I don't know if April let anyone know if she's going to be. Yeah, about 10, 10, 10, she asked me to save her a seat, but oh, look at this. All good, all good. Well, uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, I appreciate our panel of balls being here um, as our uh, interim HLA uh, CEO. And Victoria, thank you for putting together the agenda. And a big thanks to Habitat for Humanity for allowing us to meet here in this beautiful space with great technology. Um, we have the agenda before you. You all received the agenda uh, a week or so ago, so hopefully you've read through it and some minutes. Uh, there's a PowerPoint that accompanies our meeting uh, today that Victoria will pull up. So I'll start with just an overview of the board meetings, and then we'll go through introductions. We kind of put that there in case people trickled in a little bit, and it looks like we didn't have that today. <laughs> you know, as a former teacher, this is great. We all made it. By the time the bell rings, so uh, nobody's tardy. All right. Uh, so we'll start with just an overview of the uh, COC um, board of directors meetings. We meet uh, every other month. Yep, my my oh, there it is. Sorry, just okay. My computer sorry, is sorry. moving at the speed of smell right now. Okay. Y'all, sorry. It's all right. So just for any new members, most it looks like people have been, you know, everybody's been here, but you know, we are this board of appointed and elected leaders who help make policy decisions on behalf of the continuum of care. And we evaluate needs, implement strategic responses, and then measure results. And then the HLA it actually do that work. We're oversight. And so we really need to have that data. And I think what, you know, and please chime in as we set the stage for, you know, this uh, new year, uh, it's our second meeting this year, but you all have different specialties, whether it's the public defender's office or your municipality, your government, the county, um, uh, you know, JWB, um, the sheriff's office. And so you're seeing different aspects of people with specific needs in our communities, you know, especially related to housing and homelessness to prevent and reduce homelessness. So we all weigh in on what we're seeing and then inform the HLA uh, about that. And we set priorities and policies and take those back to our funding agencies um, to advocate for funding. And, and that's kind of our role. Anybody want to weigh in and, and add to that? We all good? Okay. So agendas are provided by the HLA at least a week ahead of time. And that's um, in collaboration with uh, some myself, uh, so the chair of this uh, COC, as well as HLA leadership. Uh, and executive staff to put together those agendas and send those out. And they also do that for the different committees. All right, um, the typical meeting format today, you come in, you sign in, we start on time. Um, I'll call the meeting to order. We have welcome success stories. We've moved action items to the top of the agenda uh, so that we can take care of those in case people have to uh, leave towards the end of a meeting. Um, we do follow Robert's Rules of Orders, and we have to have a quorum. Our quorum is 13, and we're there, which is wonderful. Um, obviously, motions require first and second uh, for official action. And you all have meeting dates uh, and locations and are aware of the attendance requirements. Uh, I did have uh, an email sent from Charlie Gertis this morning. Uh, we were hoping Charlie could be here, but he had other commitments, which are fine. And we had a couple of, we had a question about uh, board of directors members. So I'm just going to read this response uh, from Charlie about uh, designees on the COC board of directors. 
Um, we know that designees may be appointed to permanently represent members, uh, and a specific example would be Lieutenant Page or Sheriff Gallantieri. Um, but the board was wondering if designees are committed to represent members at individual COC board meetings per the charter. And Charlie came back with the charter only uses the term designee in relation to appointed entity board seats. So designees are limited to use on appointed entity board seats. The charter requires written vote of confidence to be provided by the appointing entity or its designee. And where's my real bit? Uh, for, for the, you repeat so, that last line again. Sure. The charter requires a written vote of confidence be provided by the appointing entity for its designee. And so we have um, Stephanie Long is also is uh, an appointed designee for Caprice and Okay. Yeah, I, I actually had brought this up because um, both Hester and I have to leave for another event and I wanted, and I had asked uh, Teresa too, well, probably a few people here, including council member Big Sanders, who's actually part of my speech. Thank you. Um, but, you know, so that we can do the voting on, at the top of the meeting so that we don't lose quorum. Um, but that was the, the question I had originally was, can I appoint someone as a designee on occasion, like, wasn't sure if I could make this meeting, but I have someone I can, you know, review the action items with and that they would be enabled to vote. And so that was the, and there, it seemed to be unclear to the people I asked. Teresa. I just wanted to reiterate the previous occasion when I to become a designee for her. However, uh, I don't believe that there was any mention of a written uh, authorization. Of that, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And I was not allowed to go in her stead. So uh, that was a, has been an ongoing question for me since that occasion. Well, it looks like per Charlie's opinion that we just need a written vote of confidence provided by the appointing entity for its designee. So, and I don't know if that can be faxed in or emailed in. I mean, I think it probably could because it doesn't say that it has to be at a certain time. Kevin. I think the, the clarification would be, is that a per meeting um, or is that a uh, permanent, uh, permanent, permanent seat mm -hmm. um, where they now officially have that spot versus, you know, every other meeting, you know, someone coming in. I think that's really the um, clarification point and probably what um, the goal is. Whether that designation implies also the ability to serve as a proxy in both. Yeah, exactly. Because I, I would enable, some, like I wouldn't send someone okay. here that how we would vote on an issue based on getting the agenda early mm -hmm. enough that they would have my authority to vote. But what I wasn't sure is if they had to be by the board in order to be in April was part of the application, right? Hey, everybody, this is Sean. Can I make a quick comment? Can Can everybody hear me? Did I lose everybody? Sean, I don't think that they can hear us online. I've let Victoria know that you have your hand up. Thank you. You're welcome. I can hear you, Sean, on Zoom. Yeah, I think there's an issue if anybody can speak to this or maybe Victoria, if they can't hear us. There's an issue uh, between appointed and elected members.
I'm wondering, did we lose the meeting now or can everybody hear me? I can hear you. Um, I'm thinking that maybe they um, disconnected to try to connect again since the audio is not working well, hopefully. Uh, less likelihood of it switching up is you're always going to need that vote of confidence from the appointing entity. So it wouldn't be very easy to do that meeting to meeting to meeting the morning of or right, something right. like that. Yeah. So I think that's where the protection for that comes in. Yeah, there's different scenarios because like Lieutenant Hay, she's like permanently the right. Right. Like, you know, sheriff's not coming. Mm -hmm. Um, so versus Occasionally, mm -hmm. there's a designee to, to stand in and to take a vote. And Stephanie and Caprice are just alternating if necessary, when necessary. Yeah, it's just named. I think, yeah. But then the day that you showed up, you didn't have that vote of confidence from, I guess, St. Petersburg, Petersburg, which is why then you weren't able to vote. Although I'm showing on the application as a designee for her. That is it. it, it so, oh, was it? Yes. Which was which was intended to allow the for Teresa in this case to attend and be able to vote if if it has been approved mm -hmm. as a vote of confidence on the application, which in her case it it was. To Kevin's point, you know the rotating is is difficult also because of having full and final authority. So the the. One of the bigger issues, which is why the application is so important and who is named there and a vote of confidence is who has full and final authority to vote or to take action on behalf of something, because that was an issue many years ago. We haven't had that in a long time, but where action would be taken, right? And then somebody back at a higher higher level position. Um, and, and the other thing about kind of you know, coming in and coming out is many of these conversations, as you know, aren't satisfied, aren't, aren't solved in a single meeting. And so when people go in and out, we often have to start over or people feel lost, right? They come in and then they feel lost in the conversation as if, and then, and then it feels like we have to start over in order to be 
polite and helpful uh, is to get people participating in the conversation is we have to start from the get-go. <laughs> I think that's a good point. Okay. Um, but I, I think to that point, I'm sorry, April, I, I agree with you. And, yeah. you know, largely the point here is if you're going to always send a designee, then that person needs to be the person like Zach is right. for the chair. Yeah. Um, I think that where, where I brought the question to you is this really rare set of circumstances. I learned something new yesterday because I set a quadruple, set drupal my schedule somehow today. I have seven things all sort of in the same space. And so as I was just trying to undo it, I'm like, you know, can I send a designee as long as I review it? Because on occasion, that could be the situation. Because I agree with you. If you're in and out, then that, this just doesn't work. But what are the actual parameters that if I have that one time unique situation where I can't be here, but we have something important to vote on? And I think that that's, that was kind of where I was coming from when I brought up that discussion. At least, I'm not saying it was all about me, but that's what I brought it up to you. Mm -hmm. I, I do want to acknowledge that some of the comments that yes. are coming up. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. because right. Amy, you know, has often has very good institutional right. memory, right. Um, and she's correct mm -hmm. with with what she says mm -hmm. there. The now, charter, yes, yeah. charter the little ambiguous about doesn't isn't fully clear, and they need amending to be clear whatever our desires are about designees right and then sean says uh, i get three stars for feeding the read from this one <laughs> we've never allowed elected positions uh to send a designee um that would be a new precedent okay so i think why don't we you know in a again i can't scan through all of those um uh but if we you know if we want to put this on uh, our next meeting to have uh, and weigh in with Charlie about possible charter language changes or amendments. You guys okay with that? To allow some density to, to clear up our designee language. Is Sean got cut off with the with the internet stuff? Does Sean is he able to speak right now? Sean, did you want to speak now? <laughs> I did I did tell them that about our issue. Okay. Oh, the internet's back up. Okay. Back up. Okay, good. All right. Anything with those comments? Again, up above. There's um there's a difference between appointed and elected positions. Yeah, cannot have a designee, just want to be clear. Got it. Okay, maybe that's what he's talking about. Um, so that would be, but an elected would be Capri Sedman, and we do have a designee here that uh, we've approved. Uh, so that is an appointed seat for the charter. Elected, oh, appointed to the board or oh, elected. Right. Oh, okay. Got it. Got it. Yeah, well, me too. Yeah, from the city. Clear okay. Okay. All right. So anyway, can we flip back to the PowerPoint? We'll talk about our meeting schedule then. So we'll put this on the can, next. Can I just ask that back yeah. something else? Are we clear now that in the case of Council Member Big Sanders, that she, since she is appointed, that I, I believe Helen may be the designee now, Probably. and. If Helen comes in her stead, she is, she has to have, I want to be clear, mm -hmm. a letter mm -hmm. saying, or is the application where she's designated on the application, and then she would be afforded the opportunity to vote in her stead on matters. I think so. I mean, Charla says the charter requires a written vote of confidence be provided by the appointing entity for its designee. So something in addition to the application has to occur. That's what it sounds like. To okay, but it must be clear in that case. That's the Yeah, that, and that's where we, if, if we update the application, then that solves the whole okay. issue, right? That's a good idea. Yeah. And then we maintain continuity with only one person come as a designee. So can I just, as the person is going to update the application, just to be totally clear what the board wants. Um, so the board application, uh, not not just the membership application, the board application, 
for appointed seats will be updated to appoint a designee. Is that is that accurate? Mm -hmm. and, and something that's it needs to include the voter confidence document yeah. from their yeah. from, from their, their outlet. Yeah. Okay, yeah. perfect. Or something I can do that. Yeah. Okay, now I've got a further question. Yeah. So when you say a vote of confidence in this, if for those city governments or those school boards, mm -hmm. are you saying that who does that vote of confidence? Mm -hmm. Is it the city council who has to vote of, provide a vote of confidence that whoever is designated is the appropriate designee? That, I mean, mm -hmm. I don't know the whole other. I think so. Why not? I mean, why not just cover all bases? So you take the city that? council and get them to vote on it. Right. That this is now the new residency. That seems, seems cumbersome. Yeah. Go ahead. Can I, can I ask that we defer this to Charlie? To Charlie? Yeah. I really think that we, we have an executive yeah. committee that follows. Mm -hmm. That's right. Can't we get Charlie to come to executive committee or something? And I think we need to defer this issue. I think it's. We will follow up with Charlie and present uh, his recommendations um, before the next meeting. So you're prepared and then we'll discuss it at the next meeting. Okay. So our COC, our board meetings are every other month. We've got the uh, scheduled. And I think we'll, that's, you know, conclusion of our overview of board meetings. Thanks. All good? Okay. And oh, can you flip back to that one? You, to be in good standing, you need to attend uh, at least three board meetings and two membership meetings, which we have. Okay. And we will be meeting here. Um, uh, and we're graciously appreciative of um, Habitat for allowing us to be here. Fantastic. All right, we'll do uh, quick introductions. Uh, let's see, how are we on? We're a little, we'll do quick introductions. Um, and then if anyone has a success story or so to, to talk about. Um, Michael, let me start. I'm Michael Zalazo with People Empowering Restoring Communities. <laughs> and I am on this board as a representative of the Providers Council. Sam Picard, Monsieur Day Community. Uh, I'm in the big day seat on the board. April Lott, Directions for Living, and I am in a provider seat. City Council Member David Jake Sanders, representing the City of San Petersburg, and I'm co chair. Good morning. I'm Anne Marie Winter. I'm with the Area Agency on Aging. I'm an at large member. I do have a success story, so we have a quick one. So we've started working in partnership with the St. Pete Housing Authority, specifically as it relates to the legacy of Jordan Park, a great new um, affordable housing uh, senior complex that we went to the ribbon cutting a few months ago. And uh, the St. Pete Housing Authority reached out to us about a woman we'll call Gina. She's 77 years old. She was homeless um, and she was able to get an apartment at the St. Pete Housing Authority. She was sleeping on the floor of her apartment um, at the Legacy of Jordan Park because all of her stuff was in storage and she didn't have the $880 that it would take to get the stuff out of storage. She had gotten uh, a notice that her items were going to be auctioned off. And so the St. Pete Housing Authority reached out to us and us as the area agency on aging, the funding um, source for services to seniors in the community to help them stay in their homes paid her $880 um, storage fee and um, helped her move her stuff into the legacy at Jordan Park. So now she can sleep in her own bed. Mm -hmm. And the partnership that we've developed um, as a result of more people knowing about what our organization does and are leaning into the issue of uh, eradicating uh, seniors that are unhoused. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Sarah Madden. I'm a business meeting for Sarah Miller, the public defender, and it's been a pleasure to be part of the meeting since July of last year. It was great to be voted on as a designee and I'm a voting member for Sarah. Thank you. Elise Menkoff, I'm Chief Programs Officer for Pinellas County Housing Authority. And last night we met with our resident in the Better Village to explain our first phase. We've transitioned 43 units offline. We are in the process of building up and creating 
senior housing out of Rainbow Village, which is off of Almonton Road, and transitioning out of public housing into Section 3. Good morning, Mariana Forsyth with CASA. And a couple of years ago, we were awarded a DB bonus in conjunction with PERC, um, who is building tiny homes for us in Clearwater. We purchased a piece of property. We've been doing rapid rehousing with that um, grant, but I'm excited to tell you that the first phase of actual buildings um, will be concluded with the renovations will be done in about three weeks and they'll be moving three families into housing there. So transitional housing in addition to the rapid rehousing specific to the water. And then the next phase with tiny homes is coming up soon. Woohoo! Yeah. Woo Good morning, everyone. I'm Kevin Rome, CEO of Bully Centers and the chair of the Providers Council. Um, I'll continue on with the uh, sharing of partnerships. Uh, uh, Bully and the St. Pete Housing Authority have a partnership with Project Based Vouchers for Whispering Pines, which has been a long, ongoing project that uh, I'm proud to report will be. Uh, we're actually doing the final walkthrough right now, which I can't be at because I'm here. Uh, but I got a good team doing the final punch list, uh, but we're hoping to open that April 1st. Um, it is 20 units for multifamily. Uh, and in addition to, I think, the partnership with the Sink Housing Authority, we have connected with Maxima Elementary School to partner with them because they uh, in, in recent uh, news reports and articles, there are 61 children at Maxima Elementary currently living in their cars, homeless, and motels. Uh, so we have took, we gave the principal and their entire uh, social work team a tour. And we are in the process of um, getting all of the, you know, the names and going through the application process. So uh, it's, a, it's a great um, conclusion to that um, long story. Uh, for which, uh, it's been four and a half years in the making. I'm Kathleen Beckman, representing the city of Clearwater and chair of the CRC. I'm Pamela Qualls, um, HLA board chair. I'm Jeff Lang, representing the city of Clearwater. I am Stephanie Long, representing Pinellas County Schools. I'm their Chief Student Support Officer, and I am uh, Caprice Edmond, our board member's designee. Good morning, Janine Devoli with the Juvenile Welfare Board. Uh, my name is Mike Creation. I'm on the Lived Experience Advisory Committee, and, and it's my birthday today. <laughs> Camille Henry, I am the CFO of the HC Florida Northside Hospital, and I am in the uh, healthcare system. Uh, good morning, Danielle Thomas, St. Pete Housing Authority, and I'm just grateful for the partnerships that we're establishing here in the community. Thank you. Zach Case, represent Sheriff Galtier for the North County Sheriff's Office. Good morning, I'm Teresa Jones. I'm a private citizen, <laughs> private concerned citizen, mm -hmm. and I'm an at-large member. Um, good morning, Esther Matthews. I'm operating as the business seat, owner of Supportive Equity Connections and Hall Administrative Solutions. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Gloria Kelly with the Homeless Leadership Alliance. And then um, in the back. Um, good morning, Mary Beth Wetzel with the City of Treasure Island. I sit in the non-entitlement uh, community seat. Uh, we did just have a nice meeting. Um, April attended with... Um, our city, the city of Gulfport, um, Zephyr Hills came down. Um, we had our police chief and fire chief there and some other members because we are doing, um, we share a social worker, the city of Gulfport and Treasure Island and shared some um, ideas as um, like Vincent DePaul was there, but it was a great meeting to kind of explore things at our very local level and what we can do and um, the program's going really well. And also this is my last meeting because my term as commissioner is up. So I don't know who will be in my seat next. Thank you. But thank you all. It's been a great experience. I'm Ross Silvers with PSTA in the transportation seat. Lisa DePaulo in the school system and I oversee the heat team. My name is Gary Small. I'm a CSC and an HLA member. I'll work with a lot of local churches helping out the homeless and food banks in the uh, North Park, Wilmington area. 
Um, the I just didn't want to miss my opportunity to do so. We have been working, many of us in this room have been working uh, with an individual who is has been living homeless for the past 12 years in the city of Clearwater. Um, she is wheelchair bound. She has an emotional support animal. Um, it has been extremely difficult for a variety of reasons of the barriers that, that, that are in place that don't necessarily prioritize her. Um, in any case, we have recently been able to get her uh, a voucher and um, into her own apartment. Um, she's doing it beautifully right now. The reason I want to, I want to, A, I want to celebrate it. It's just an amazing um, accomplishment. Uh, she is so, so, so appreciative. Um, she's now able to say things like, I never thought that I would ever be worthy mm -hmm. of a home. And uh, some of the things that she says are just very um, touching. Um, and the, one of the reasons, though, that I bring it up here today is that she is now in her apartment. We've been able to get her things like towels and a shower curtain and, um, a, you know, cooking utensils. But it's basically empty. So I just want to just say, if anybody has, I am going to touch base with um, with uh, Mike here for the restore because everything's got to go. But um, if anybody knows of a place, you know, or has items that might be helpful to um, to get her furnished, um, she's currently sitting in like you know like uh, beach chairs mm -hmm. um, in 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 her home if she's not in her wheelchair. So in any case, if if anybody has any ideas, just send it send them to me. I'd be yes. I'm happy to give her a voucher to her to store. So okay. Ask my first, whatever she doesn't get, send her shop okay. with us. And, and if she's over sixty, we can probably provide. She isn't. She, okay. you know, which is why some of the challenges that we had, I think she's like 57. Mm -hmm. um, so she's not quite there. Yeah, pineapple program. So yeah. they're really dedicated to families. Oh, okay. Um, okay. And she it does not have children. Again, yeah, another reason why it was difficult. Is she considered disabled? She is. According to DCF, disabled. Yes. We can help her. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We've got resources. Yeah. We've got places in Chicago. Yeah. Yeah. The church that volunteers to the north side back 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 to the and we have a whole bunch of pots, pans, glasses, and more than welcome to come by and take whatever she needs. Okay. How many do we have online? Um, we have six. Okay. We have Amy Foster, Karen Gatcham, Sean King, Yvonne Morales, Cindy Kazowich, and Laura Wojohn. All right. Fantastic. Thank you all for being here. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Isn't it wonderful how we just mentioned we need a little help and we can, it can all come together. Um, you know, I did that with a woman who was recently housed too in Clearwater and it's, you just put the word out there, tables, and chairs. And, okay, fantastic. All right, let's take a look at the consent agenda. Uh, if you can look at the uh, attendance that is indicated, like we don't have page numbers here, but we have the meeting minutes from January 12th as well as the attendance in January. Any corrections, additions on either of these? So I, I, I do. So it has me listed as absent, and I talked to Victoria about it. I wasn't getting the email. Okay. However, I did get several text messages from several people at this table that I should have been there. Okay. Because of the vote. So I just wanted to make note of that, although I guess it is considered an absence. Okay. The only other item I noticed on the attendance was Council Member Vic Sanders had showed virtual. She was here for most. See, we can't be asking me to meet these. I don't know who's going She to. was here for most of the meeting, okay. and then she went for a full So I don't know how that should be reflected. Okay. She was here because she actually clicked. Yeah, I was going to say. Yeah, she was here for most of it. Okay. Well, so do she we want to make a change to that? Yeah, I, I do have that change. Okay. All right. Any uh, additional changes or comments on the um, meeting minutes? Okay. I would move approval with no changes to the agenda. Okay. Second. Right. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 And then the um, January 12th board meeting minutes. Motion to approve. So, so moved. 
Second. And all in favor? Uh, uh, thank you. All right, we're going to talk um, just a little bit about uh, advocacy. And, um, you know, we have some legislation uh, going on at the state level. There's uh, Florida Senate Bill 1530 and House Bill. Um, 1365. 1365, right. <laughs> uh, do we have a slide on this? Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry, I tried to pull it up. And so it would prohibit sleeping on public property, <laughs> allow residents and businesses to sue local governments for non compliance, and authorize municipalities to create designated camping zones with strict requirements. Strict requirements might sound good. Um, the HLA was contract or contacted by the media and created a statement, which was reviewed by our board of directors uh, and members. And this statement was shared by the HLA, not the CEO or the COC um, board of directors. Um, so, is anyone not aware of this legislation? Okay, um, we, you know have an advocacy committee kind of in name um, that is expected to develop an advocacy agenda to be approved by the board of directors. Um, and this committee, you know, in best case scenario is uh, expected to advocate on behalf of the COC and to address advocacy issues that arise throughout the year. Um, capacity is an issue, right? I mean, every we've got a number of committees um, and just want to talk about whether we have interest, we need a chair for this committee that's going to go forward. Um, and just wanted your, your feedback about, uh, is it a priority? I think it's important. It would be wonderful to have, but looking at our capacity and our membership, um, is this something we want to pursue right now? Yeah. I asked at the last meeting if we have a lobbyist and I think the answer was yes. Um, so I don't know if the so if there's a statewide association that is connected to a lobbyist that is actually working on this issue. Um, do we know the answer to that? We don't have a local lobbyist, right? Um, but yes, we are you know part of that coalition that has the statewide level for all of the COCs, and right? Those have and, and I'm sure that on this particular issue, there is unanimity um, among the statewide COCs and HLA. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah, actually, I think it, I think it's kind of important to discuss yeah. a little bit what we discussed at the providers council because you know That's that that there isn't you uh, unanimous support <laughs> with the COCs. And the argument I thought was an at least an interesting argument mm -hmm. that some of them had that it'll force local municipalities to actually put resources towards this. Um, I don't know that it's a realistic argument, but I actually thought it was an argument nonetheless. And I think that I don't know who brought up the fact that if the numbers just at Pinellas Safe Harbor, Pinellas Hope couldn't handle the additional numbers coming in. So that's where it becomes unrealistic. But there isn't uniform agreement against that. So, but what is the position of the statewide association on this? Does anyone know? I'm not aware that they have one. Which yeah. saddens me that right. they, that they would not have one. They haven't. Uh, I actually them. spoke mm -hmm. in Tallahassee uh, at one at the judicial uh, services committee, mm -hmm. whatever subcommittee of the House. Uh, there was a Senate. There was a Senate. The Senate and. Uh, it was it was disturbing to see our, our the members of that committee hear from not only myself but from others uh, about their those who are formerly homeless veterans etc about the concerns about uh, in particular Senate Bill thirteen sixty five that's why I knew that number so well and this is another they seem to have no compassion for what they were the issues and how it would impact the, the local governments, but but in, in, the individuals who are actually experiencing homelessness. Uh, I, it disturbs me that the, the state organization has not taken a position right. on this. Right. This is another unfunded mandate. Right. I, I shared with them that there are municipalities like the one I formerly worked for 
who do currently fund numerous shelters organizations. I shared with them the horrific story of when the city of St. Petersburg made national news when our police officers cut up the tents. Our response to that was to establish a, a, a camp ourselves, which they're advocating for in this bill, the city government set up right. shelters mm -hmm. that can last no more than 365 days. Mm -hmm. and, and from that incident, mm -hmm. we not only initially set up that temporary shelter, what they're suggesting here, we then went on from 2008 to fund shelters and help establish Pinell's Hope which we continue to fund to this day. We also fund Safe Harbor and that there are individuals who cannot actually go to any of these shelters. You know, so I, I, it disturbs me that the state organization is not taking an opinion on this. And I sit here telling you that it's going to pass and our, our governor is going to sign this and what are we going to do? And we as an organization, should you know i don't know about having an advocacy committee but it, we should be ringing the bells of our state organization if they're not stepping out on this i just uh, well, i'm, I'm sorry sure. getting so loud and boisterous no, <laughs> but it, I mean, it should have been at providers council because it was yeah. it's twice as loud as you just were and and probably twice as boisterous. No, this is this is unnecessary mm -hmm. uh Legislation and, and, and it's it's criminal. Uh, they don't want to say it's criminalizing homelessness, right. but that's exactly what it's doing. And, and oh. I, I know that where I went with this at the Providers Council, and I don't want April to give me the look of death, is I think that we need to, if we're going to do advocacy on this, that we need to really push the middle district because this is clearly violating HUD rules. Mm -hmm. And I think that you've got an unconstitutionally mm -hmm. unfunded mandate, unconstitutional unfunded mandate that should get tied up in federal in a federal district court before it ever right so before it I, ever becomes like live right so in addition to releasing the, the, the press release which i thought was was well done is actually turn that into a letter um that is signed by the coc um provided that all the members agree to what was in the letter um and and send that to our entire Janellis delegation um, immediately. I mean, so, yeah. you know, session ends March 7th. Mm -hmm. So a couple things. All yep. of the COC members do not agree with the letter. That's why okay. it's issued on behalf of the HLA. Okay. I don't think that our um, coalition lobbyists are not active here. What I think they're not doing is taking a stand yet or taking a statement. I have heard that recently this has begun to be backed by some dollars. And so I believe that's part of the work of what the coalition has been doing is saying that if you're going to do this, you have to put some money behind it. Well, well I'm going to say this is solely about that because and the reason there hasn't been a statement is because there isn't a level of confidence that that is there. Because the proposal does state that the bill states that increased funding for homeless shelters is included in this proposal, as well as increased funding for substance abuse and mental health treatment. But there's no confidence that that Adequate. is going to actually no. come, and it's going to be well, at a level of adequacy that is needed. Is it, is it being appropriate for those dollars? That's, that's, what's, not, that's what's not theater. there, right? Okay. It says, and, and that's why people are like, "Well, right. the spirit of it is okay. We're going to do this, but we're going to fund more shelters." But there's no language and specificity on how much that is and what that. Well, is. is there a way to work that into a letter that people would be comfortable? I think what we need to be prepared to do here is determine through our recent point in time what our street numbers are, what our capacity is in all of our shelters, because it's all it's going to come down to data. It's going to come down to um, and not just beds, right? Because at, at the providers council, something Lieutenant Hayes said, so he's got 500 beds, but on any given night. He has 350, 400 there because that's his capacity from a safety perspective to manage the people in shelter. So that means there's an additional 100 beds physically at Safe Harbor, but no capacity to serve, to serve that 100 people, right. right? And so we need to compare our numbers on the streets with our, our utilization of all of our shelters. And that gives you your numbers that if this bill were enacted today, uh, where would they go? And, and not so the street, sure. not even mention the fact that individuals can sue 
right. local government. Yes. Mm -hmm. right. That's a whole and other conversation. Yeah. Um, Amy's got her hand up. I'm she sorry. Has a moment. <laughs> Thank you, Chair Beckman. I just wanted to mention, I feel like um, Michael and some others have tried to say it, but um, you know, there are advocacy groups that would normally fight against a bill like this that are not fighting against it with hopes to sue government um, around this issue that you are um, wrestling with, which is whether there's enough shelter space or not. Um, and so, I think that is the challenge from what I can tell. So Florida Coalition to End Homelessness is redoing their website right now, but the National Coalition to End Homelessness has taken a stance on this bill and news articles I can find, as has the Florida Coalition. Um, but I think there, um, you know, again, is probably folks that you would normally see come out against this. I know Southern Poverty Law Center has already let us know that they're excited about this bill because they plan to use it to sue us. Um, I, I just wanna mention, I know Helen has talked about our, our 10 cities we've had popping up. You know, our homeless community knows the laws. Um, they know they're not allowed on public property. And so they are now setting up um, communities on private property, which we don't have um, laws against here. Um, I'd like to keep it that way. I can tell you I'm experiencing immense pressure from council members to pass new ordinances against um, camping, even on private property. Um, so I, I think there this will be the first of um, a very slippery slope for activities against our homeless. And I think we're going to see lawsuits. Right now we have a encampment at Allendale um, that we are trying to work through and uh, neighbors are accusing those folks of breaking into their homes and doing things and um, it's simply not true and so the the fear mongering will continue um, but I did just want to raise the the conversation that I do think the state group and um, the national group have taken a stand on this um, and uh, the other thing I just want to flag for everybody, which I think is a really important conversation we need to have that I think we've tried to have over the years. And um, I don't know, maybe it's dwindled a little bit just based on a recent report Helen forwarded to me from um, Lieutenant Hayes. We, we don't have the shelter space we need for the types of people who are experiencing homelessness. And I've told our police officers, you cannot... Um, you know, have encounters with somebody in a, a wheelchair, for example, because we don't have anywhere to put anyone who is non-ambulatory. The majority of people going into Safe Harbor are over 65, and we have no type of shelter in our county that is appropriate for that age group. And that's a conversation that we need to start having because when I'm out on the street uh, talking to people, I'm seeing the graying of our shelter population, which we knew was coming, and we still have not addressed as a community. I have a, I have a question, right? So when I looked at the definition of the advocacy committee, my question is, what is the teeth behind it? So what was the push behind it? So it's saying that it's going to develop and approve is there is there going to be a um a um body that's going to move it up to the Tallahassee level because this in my other in my other world as the president of the NAACP this is absolutely one of our focal points mm -hmm. so I would want to be a part of it but I'd like to know what's the push behind it or are we just bringing more issues to put on the table to kind of discuss here well I just and to answer your question because I think we're talking about two different things mm -hmm. we're talking specifically about the Senate bill and House bill mm -hmm. but broadly the advocacy committee when did we have that meeting that, that was, was 2021 yeah over at out there there was a group of us that met to talk about doing advocacy to have one pagers to be able to go in front of city councils or county commissions and do some of this but that conversation changed about a year ago remind me victoria when we had the discussion here about because I, I i made the point that we have the hla 
and you know where it becomes tricky for agencies and we've all experienced this in the last couple of years is when you wear your board member hat versus your agency mm -hmm. level hat because advocacy can be really tricky mm -hmm. for an agency. And I think Lariana and I've had, had this kind of, I think we all have yeah. Yeah. Um, about, you know, how do you balance that out? You know, when you have other programs and other funding and how that might be met on the state level. Mm -hmm. So I am both for and against an advocacy committee mm -hmm. because of those conflicting reasons. I, listen, anyone in this room knows that me and Shai, like you don't use those two words in a sentence, mm -hmm. but at some point I have to say, all right, well, I'm the, the, you know, in charge of an agency and we get funding here and maybe I shouldn't advocate so hard mm -hmm. where someone like Sean, because I think we had this conversation with Sean and all the work that they do on the state level advocate, advocating for you know, additional affordable housing. I mean, so it's it, like, if it fits our mission, great, but when it doesn't, you know, it becomes more complicated and we should empower the people that are working in this every day mm -hmm. as their full-time jobs to be able to do more yeah. advocacy. Yeah. So I think that that's where we get into this weird balancing act. Yeah. So. So, so just to introduce the advocacy, uh, advocacy committee, it originated from someone had an issue that they came into CLC with and wanted us to support. And it was identified at that time, we had no formalized committee or group to speak with one voice. So that's where the advocacy committee evolved. It was to support organizations here that are members of COC and some issues that they may have addressed. Since then, it has gone forward more towards more the legislative issues that all of us address. And unfortunately, we think that when we have members here today, we, we bring together certain talents and skills and resources. So elected official taxpayer dollars pay for lobbyists. Okay. So with me being an elected official, uh, Council Member Beckman being a, uh, an elected official, I'm looking at my legislative um, affairs list that council members bring and our lobbyists fight for for St. Petersburg. Now, one of these is something that St. Pete is taking up mm -hmm. because we have lobbyists that you all indirectly pay for it. You know, so it's, it's utilizing, so going back to what, what um, Mr. Gelato said, um, the shift did change, but we would never, the quorum issue to the precedence over why the committee never fully got it all because we could never get a quorum. Um, so I agree that an advocacy committee is greatly needed, but I think we need to finalize what is course is going to be. Are we going to support COC issues and, and simply, you know, as simple as making phone calls, passing out flyers, or are we going to concentrate and utilize the stronger um, issue of policy change and legislative issues that will impact all of us? Mm -hmm. So that wasn't something that I, I don't think we've come to a resolve on, um, but there's a reason why elected officials are appointed to COC. And I think you need to best utilize um, those. And I think for me in my time space, I would love for that to be, because I can't be on every committee we have for COC. That's just not something you can do. But if the advocacy committee can be defined as those elected officials and those that have direct influence in getting, making difference with policy, I think that should be a cleaner use of the advocacy committee. Um, just my two cents, but I just want to let you know for the city of St. Petersburg, either one of those bills are even on, on our radar. Can I have one additional question? Forgive me because I think I'm probably the newest person here. Um, in previous HLACOC committees that I've been a part of, only members are allowed to put a voice vote to the committee. Is this the same type of committee? Yeah, but I think you open those, I mean, you can invite people from the community to come mm -hmm. and help shape that discussion and inform, right? I mean, yeah. It right. requires membership, mm -hmm. right, to the COC is mm -hmm. what it is all it really requires is membership. It's not mm -hmm. just this group, right? Mm -hmm. It's membership. So, and there are dozens of ways for people to become a member mm -hmm. of the COC, um, but yes, it, 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 per charter requires membership to be on a committee, 
Um, and we have scholarships for membership. And, and, and the only reason I ask is I was I was a part of the DEI um, committee. Actually, I chaired the DEI committee, and there were so many people that wanted to be a part of that committee, but were unwilling to pay the membership or didn't have it to pay the mm -hmm. membership. Mm -hmm. And so you eliminate a faction of folk that have a very strong voice mm -hmm. just because of the mandate of the membership. And so that's why I was asking. But it's good. But I think there's a way to to assist them with becoming members mm -hmm. if the issue is the mm -hmm. membership thing. Oh, absolutely. Right? We, make it we, we absolutely as a group have to be able to have a way to ensure right that their voice can still be a part of us absolutely. if they don't have the and, and there's various levels right of, of membership fees mm -hmm. and those kinds of things. But there is a way to do that. Mm -hmm. I know there is, and so I just want to make sure we're doing that. Okay. Okay. I would commit to any scholar. If people Me want too. to join, I will make sure. I'll write a check for their membership. Okay. Thank you. I, I, I not that. some corporate check for some, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <It's> just joining. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. Absolutely. Commissioner um, uh, Flowers has her hand up. Good morning, everyone. First, let me apologize for being late, but I was on a legislative call since the session is supposed to end on March 7th or 8th. Um, but I wanted to speak to the concern uh, um, regarding, um, and I'm going to say retaliation. Uh, Mike Jalazo was trying to say very nicely, but the potential for retaliation against something that you're asking for for an organization that may not be met well because you're asking for something um, for uh, to assist persons 60 or 65 and older from homelessness. Um, a couple of ways around that for your consideration. Um, speaking with either a senator and or house member to have them to file a bill, which would only be one of the several that they have an opportunity to file to address funding or even a pilot project specifically for persons 60 or 65 and older that are homeless. <clears throat> and being able to kind of maneuver that through so that it is a proposed bill and the advocacy or the strong arming of it would come from that House member or that senator versus an organization that could potentially be retaliated against if you're receiving funding from the state. And the reason I'm saying that is because uh, Senate President Pasadomo really wanted to address um infant mortality specifically in African-American women. And that is her issue. And because it became her issue, those of us that have been working on that teamed up to support her in that and support any legislation that will provide funding for that. That bill is moving through. Uh, um, it's already gone through appropriations. So it's going to happen. So there are ways that you can move some legislation through without um, being the negative advocate <clears throat> such that it could hurt your other organizations that you may be a part of, or if a uh, perk is getting money from the state and you fear retribution on that, or if the state is getting money, we already saw where uh, Representative Jocks, unfortunately, has made his threats to the city of St. Pete, being upset about what the city of St. Pete is doing regarding uh, supporting de &I programs. So there are ways around it to, to try to alleviate any retribution or kickback on that. Um, and the other thing I just want to say is there is always going to be somebody in the House or the Senate that is opposed to something that is good for communities that local government is asking for. That is always going to happen. The rub becomes how you address it. Um, you know, if they feel like they, meaning the House or Senate, if they feel like you're trying to make them look small or be disrespectful. Oh yeah, they're gonna pull out the big guns. They're gonna um, you know, try to push to get certain appropriations that you're asking for to get them TP'd or to have them not even heard period um, or to move them through so many committees that it loses um, the strength that it already has. So, um, you know, if we have an issue or problem that we say needs to be addressed such as Amy has already noted or listed, um, then we've got to determine, are we willing to, to support that? Are we willing to find a way to eliminate or alleviate that issue? 
or are we going to be fearful of losing finances for programs because we don't want to make someone mad? That could happen at any time. Any House member, Senator, um, even the, the, the governor, and we've seen him do that. You know, they could strike through anything at any time they want to. And your your funding is off the table. Your request is dead. Um, and and it's it's over until you get a new administration in. So I just kind of wanted to share that. May, perhaps you all have already talked about that before I got on the call. I don't know. When, so I do apologize for being repetitive. But share that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Flowers. Thank you. And I think, you know, it draws in, into focus um, when we were looking at versions of the letter, and Michael from our lead, uh, uh, lived experience advisory committee had some really good uh, suggestions as far as wording as well. Is um, we looked at a response from Senator DeSigley, who now is what chair of uh, uh, Hope Villages, mm -hmm. right? And so if we thought we would have a voice up in Tallahassee, I mean that could be it. He did mention, you know, it needs appropriate funding. I think the biggest question that Kevin's got is. You know, and for all of us, what's appropriate funding? I mean, we need triple, quadruple what we have right now. And do we really think they're going to do that? And then phasing whatever they're thinking about doing, phasing it in because you've got to staff up and, and build capacity. And that's unrealistic. You know, this thing goes into effect July 1st. Where, where are we putting people, you know? So I, I just want to clarify <clears throat> Because again, I think we're blending the two issues. Because I think we have an issue that we actually have to address. Yeah. And then we're talking about the issue yeah, of the exactly. advocacy committee. Because and and not to not really disagreeing with what Commissioner Flowers said, but I think my point is it's been a strange place running a nonprofit in the state of Florida when the governor was running for president. <laughs> and the governor, let's make no mistake, is going to be continue running for the Republican nomination. Mm -hmm through the rest of his term because he's gonna run again in 2028. And that's okay, I'm not criticizing that. I'm saying that um, policy in Florida has been different and we get caught up in these weird areas as far as you know what's woke or what's CRT or what's things on the state level. And that's really what I'm really describing is, is I think that Commissioner Flowers said it correctly. And we all know this, that there's been a retributive nature broadly because I don't think that you know disagreeing with a state senator or you know you know what what are our expectations of Senator DeSigli or Representative Jock or Representative Anderson you know I'm not concerned as much about that because there's going to be differing opinions you know we have to understand how to operate as agencies in the nonprofit sector at least from my world in the state of Florida right now because it's been a different place. And I think that that's a broad, broader discussion. Going back to the advocacy committee, and again, like I usually do, agreeing with Council Member Fig Sanders, is we have to make sure: do we need a committee? Yes. Yes. Um, how is it best served? And I appreciate your thoughts on that because you know what, we've got to really think this through on the best way to do it. You know, and I think we all sit in different seats. We've got elected officials. We've got quasi-governmental. We've got Nonprofits. I would imagine there's for profits. We've got staff of jurisdictions. This is it is tricky. You know, I think sometimes for for Zach, you know, I know pretty well, and I think we all know pretty well where Sheriff Baltieri stands on certain issues, and we understand where you're going to advocate for that because that's your position. And a lot of times we agree. It's just how do we get there? And I think that that makes these kinds of boards complicated. And why going back a couple of Versus because then the agency is tasked a lot more and we have to enable them to have the ability to do the work and do the advocacy on behalf of us because that it's not insulating us. It's the way it's supposed to be set up, the way it was set up in every other COC in the country. And that's why we've done that. So I'm going to get off my horse because I got to leave here in a few minutes to go. Yeah. Um... So again, I also believe that we're confusing a variety of issues and therefore we're not going to get anywhere on the particular issue at hand, which is the legislation that, as Teresa said, I completely agree, which is it is going to be signed. 
um, it is it is happening. Um, and so whether or not the middle district or some of these national advocacy groups that have in fact gotten wind of another shenanigan happening in Florida uh, and are preparing to take action. And so there may be a stay on something. I personally do not believe that this is a funding issue. Uh, first of all, there's not enough money to solve this issue across the state of Florida or even across the country. There's, there's right this, there's so much philosophical um, uh, discussions and or philosophical uh, conflicts on the issue that it, it's not a, it's not a money issue. Uh, it, it, solely. It's not a money issue solely. Regardless, e even if it was a money issue solely, there's not enough money. There's not enough land. We are the most po we are the most densely populated community, right, in the state of Florida. So there's not even enough land in, in Pinellas County. Like, I don't know where these things are going. If you read the, the, the bill, there is a lot of language around not in my backyard type language. It's mentioned multiple times uh, around not in my backyard. So at, at the at the providers council where we essentially used our entire providers council on this topic, you know I do believe that I don't know this um, formally, but to Teresa's point, uh, and I think to some of the providers uh, who were at the providers council point, right? We do Pinellas County does have uh, Safe Harbor and Pinellas Hope. So Pinellas Hope was in fact set up, you know, it meets a lot of the criteria outlined in this, right? There's no camping bill. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of things that that would would that we would recognize, right, at, at Pinal So uh, the county has has funded that substantially. The city of St. Pete and other communities have have funded that in various degrees. Um, I have not heard from Pinal So on their position on this bill. However, I would assume that our, our, our community people who can be sued, right? So the county and, you know, these municipalities are going to take a position. If I were them, I would be taking a position to say, we fund this already. We fund this, mm -hmm. right? Um, but we need to hear from Pinellas Hope. I, I, I don't know who's talking to Pinellas Hope, but if you've ever tried to get into Pinellas Hope, yeah. It happens on Tuesday yeah. from 7 to 9 a.m. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a, it, it, this is going to sound, this is going to sound disgusting, the words I'm getting ready to use. Um, but getting into to Pinellas Hope is a cattle call. There are two spots available. Mm -hmm. There are 28 people who have been picked up at 5 a.m. to get there by 7 a.m. Um, hoping and praying and begging that they're going to be the ones that sh that's chosen. So if you've never gotten into Pinellas Hope, try to get into Pinellas Hope, just understand there, there's going to be, so if Pinellas Hope is our answer, we probably need to have Pinellas Hope here yeah. um, or somewhere with the HLA. There needs to be a conversation somewhere with Pinellas Hope about, okay, so what are we doing uh, if Pinellas Hope is the answer? Is there going to be a need for increased funding for Pinellas Hope? No doubt. No doubt their structure of getting in which is this window of two hours and this, this very degrading and humiliating process is probably no doubt driven by funding mm -hmm. as opposed to their hearts, yeah. right? There's not enough space right. there, right? Safe Harbor, back to the criminalization of the homeless, right? This bill will allow, and quite frankly, I think require law enforcement to um, pick, arrest, and or trespass, and or pick these individuals up mm -hmm. who are in fact camping um, in a variety of places and take them. Sheriff Gaultier is, is not gonna be a fan of we're, re we're returning to prior safe harbor days and we're now jailing them. So where they would have to go is to in fact our jail diversion homeless shelter, which is safe harbor. Right. And so he doesn't have the capacity there, but there, there's there's some real things that we need to spend some time on. Yeah, yeah. Before I, yeah. I, I think um, what I would ask you to consider mm -hmm. is the elected officials, those that have direct impact, that are not um, concerned with retribution. 
Yeah, we have that in this talk. For example, we do it all the time. We send all these to Tallahassee, you know, we're going to work with people. So that's not a concern for myself and the commission of powers and yourself um, as to those particular, those particular legislative um, items that we should be following. Because we are starting to get emails from people downtown talking about the homeless and different oh, things. That's like our that. start. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's something we deal with on the right. Yeah. So I'm not worried about it. I do understand the sensitivity of our nonprofit. Right. I get it. Mm -hmm. um, and so we can shield that, we can eliminate that mm -hmm. threat um, because we're working on their behalf mm -hmm. citywide where they reside and operate in the cities that we are elected to serve. Mm -hmm. So I think that should be a fantastic starting point for right. those of us that are already in that mm -hmm. for us to if we be are looking for a committee and a start and a purpose and a mission that should begin with that. Okay. All right. Kevin. Well also I, I don't I don't know how this is not a funding issue though because we do have we do have you have to we have empty schools mm -hmm. that have been empty for decades. We have empty hospitals Churches. that have been empty for decades. We have places. Mm -hmm. But it, it comes down to the. But it's a of that the wants to make, and it is impacted by funding. But it's a it, at its root is a philosophical change that being in housed is not acceptable in the state of Florida. Exactly. And funding is needed, so. That's that's really at the root of this, and I agree with uh, Council Member Big uh, Sanders that some of us can take positions um, without concern for retribution on this issue. Um, and you know, there's a point where you have to be compelled to lead and take action um, because this is going to affect thousands of people that each of us serves every day. And if we don't take a position on this at some point that everybody can agree to, and, and it potentially could be very watered down because we want everybody, or at least as the majority to agree. I think that's something that we really want to consider doing. Mm -hmm. I have to leave. Go ahead, Sarah. Sorry. Um, just something that it doesn't stop with the state of Florida because the state of Florida, this isn't a reaction that what the Supreme Court is going to hear a piece on this mm -hmm. this yes. spring, mm -hmm. this issue. And Florida's getting out ahead of this because of what the Supreme Court might say and why is the whole system and you can throw things with Smith. Mm -hmm. So this is all the, the, the resources I'm referencing have been around in prior mm -hmm. administrations, prior cycles. And we didn't we didn't utilize those resources then. That's fine. Yeah. So no, I, there's, okay. two th there's two things that I think everyone. Yeah, and I, I got to go. So let okay. me just say this. Yeah, real quick. So I want to really make clear as a caveat is, again, I, I think on this issue, I agree with you, Amory. We all have to stand up and really be advocates on this. This is a no brainer on this, the Senate and House bill. I think on the advocacy committee is where we get into this gray right. area where we have to make I think that original discussion started like two years ago, Lariana, when we were talking about why why we weren't sending more people to be part of the DEI committee. Because and we and I asked the question, is it because we're all concerned about retribution out of Tallahassee? And we that's kind of where we came from. So I think that we are talking about two different issues. Here. And I just want to be clear on that. I apologize, Kevin. Right. We gotta go open the hub. Right. The, the, the thing is is that we aren't all, you know, we, we can talk about Tallahassee all day long. Locally, we do not have agreement on this issue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we can point fingers mm -hmm. somewhere to Tallahassee. Mm -hmm. We don't have local agreement on this issue. There isn't local agreement. I mean, there is an agreement among the COCs mm -hmm. across the state. Mm -hmm. There isn't agreement on the issue. As Amy said, there are people who have historically... I'm going to say, then our strongest voices, our strongest advocates, who are like not only in support, but are rallying support to say, we are going to sue all of you. Mm -hmm. 
And so again, if we talk about lawsuits, right, wrong, or not, right, they're going to be expensive. There's going to be a whole lot of money that's going to have to defend it, even if they win, mm -hmm. right? All of those kinds of things. But the, you know, to hear, you know, you know, Commissioner Flowers and even uh, Council Member Fig Sanders to say, right, there are people who can use their voices. Those voices aren't in agreement. Mm -hmm. So we have to figure, you know, watering it down. Sure, I think that's what version two was was a watered down, yeah. right? We're trying right. not to we're trying not to offend anybody. Right. I know. Just think of the consequences. Yeah. We're trying not to offend anybody because there's there isn't agreement on on the the issue. I think advocacy is one thing that's going to take us a minute and and some time to do to coordinate and to and try to have these conversations where we can get a watered down version that everybody agrees to, yeah. right? And we're not offending anybody. I, I literally, I don't know how to do some of those things. Like I just want to take a position mm -hmm. um, and and suffer the consequences, I guess. Mm -hmm. But but the practical side of this, there's a practical side of this, which is that you know there was word on the street that the governor once signed. Right. Usually things take effect July 1st. Right. Right. But there was word on the street and I don't know where it landed um, is that it would take effect the minute the, the minute he signs. Mm -hmm. Right. So there is some opportunity sometimes for that. Right. The minute the, the signature takes place. Right. That it goes into effect. Even if somebody was able to, to advocate and get some grace around it's going to go into effect October 1, let's just say. Yeah. Right. We have to start organizing on what does that look like for the people that we care about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think we need to talk about what happens to the people that are picked up that more mm -hmm. only can tell us how or don't get into not mm -hmm. where the people who are picked up and left or stay harbor or the family to say I mean where are gonna put families? Yeah, because yeah. they're stable. Stable. Yes. Yeah, because yeah. 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 that's yeah. the part where we start to say, yeah. well now yeah. it feels yeah. criminalized. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what right. the I don't know what the requirement yeah. is mm -hmm. or let's say the sheriff's office or whoever picks them up if there's no place. We can engage. So officers have discretion. The law is the law. It's a misdemeanor. It's not a forcible felony. This is not. Officers have discretion. So whether this goes in the gets signed off on, uh, you know, March thirtieth or 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 whatever. Any deputy in the county, any law enforcement officer in the county, has discretion on whether to make an arrest in that situation. This is a situation where we would hope, as the sheriff's office and as the overseer of the jail's facilities that other law enforcement agencies would use discretion in that position so that we don't turn the jail back into pre-state harbor days where we have a thousand homeless people in the arms street. So like I said, it's there's I don't know, I'm rereading it now because I have an idea. But but I thought the law was if if I'm a business owner or a resident and I see a tent here in this public spot, I can say that's against the law. So you, you have to enforce action. So, right. they, so they would have to enforce action and they could say, we're going to trespass this person yeah. from our property right. and then they leave. Right. If they don't leave, that's a different conversation. But then they can sue you. Mm -hmm. Then they sue you. Right. 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 So because that's what it, that's what I, I, I understand. So I while you you yeah. may have discretion, you right. may have discretion. The, the resident trumps the, it. The, the bill. business owner, and, yeah, right. I so piece of it. I'm only speaking to yeah. the piece of yeah. right. the lowest level of law enforcement uh, taking appropriate action mm -hmm. given the situation. Well, then I think that's where the nuance the the people that support it are like, yeah, now you all or you know providers have to go find the beds and space. So it's forcing that. Um, I think, but, not, but again, that doesn't happen with this. I think there's two things of this that probably almost everybody agrees with, which is the first one is that nobody really wants to see any human uh, have to live somewhere where they don't have access to a bathroom or something mm -hmm. like that. So in a parking lot, in a tent. And I think most people don't want to see, you disagree with that? I do, I disagree. I do not believe that there, I do not believe that everybody agrees that people who are living homeless are deserve and should have 
access to a bathroom and to the facilities and the things that they need. I do not agree that, that, that everybody agrees with that. Everybody in this room agrees with that. I believe that there are some very pejorative, very hostile, very um, aggressive beliefs about the people who are living homeless. And what they should what they are, what they deserve, what they don't deserve. Um, I, absolutely. It's written into this bill, by the way. It's yeah. written by, it, this bill's written by some of those people. But Maslow's hierarchy of needs starts with housing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Right, so. And yet we have thousands, probably, of vacant buildings. Mm -hmm. I've been trying to get a, a, a church in Clearwater um, space. Uh, for years, the work I've done trying to get that, it is literally, we could, I don't even know what we could do for families with this space. I can't get the support in Clearwater to make it happen. So, you yeah, know. Do you think that support is philosophical? I think there's a lot of philosophical. What was the other thing that we all agreed to? You said there were two. So, do you, so with the Imagineer industry or this, that people uh, should be incarcerated or go to jail so because in that philosophical is the is the stigma that homeless people are violent criminals, mm -hmm. drug abusing, lazy. low lazy, low. So there's that yeah. stigma there, right? So the reason they should be in a tent or in this place is because of those things, not solely because they're homeless. Um, and, and I think the stigma really lies in that criminality, uh, stigma that's associated with criminal. Um, the problem we yeah that things happened to me and i pulled myself up by my bootstraps um so yeah that things happened to me too and yet i still have a home because i'm willing to work and i we've all heard every one of them i mean yep. it's it, it's but if we are going to be so naive as to think those things aren't or well, we also can't allow those select few people to stop what we're trying to accomplish. Sure. Oh, I agree with that. We wouldn't be here every single month, 17 times a, a month, trying to address it. Because the challenge we're going to have is what to do with those individuals that um, even when offered shelter, don't want to go to the, right. to your worst, the cattle call or to right. even to safe harbor right. or whatever. So I think, you know, to, to just kind of keep us on track, so we are in consensus that we do want an advocacy committee. We may need to look at the advocacy, uh, the requirements about quorum um, that were mentioned about people attending the meeting and actually getting things done. So again, that's part of, um, of getting that committee together and changing our uh, charter that way. Uh, Michael, yeah, did you want to say? Um, it's going to be different tag in terms of uh, what we want to do for advocacy. I'm thinking uh, something practical is there any position that the COC does has in support of like the redevelopment of the uh, Tropicana field? And I know they got a specific amount set aside for community development and the uh, affordable housing part, but is there anything specifically that we know of that helps uh, Upper Penelope's County. Um, do, does the COC actually support or approve the deal because of the, because uh, they that community kind of got screwed 30 years ago mm -hmm. and they're afraid it might do it again. Mm -hmm. And personally, it's, it's really not that great a deal because the affordable housing aspect uh, just kind of uh, important to this committee, anyway, uh, is spread out over 15 years. So I'm thinking uh, that this committee ought to put something out saying we don't support it or we support it with modifications so that there is more uh, help for the community, not just in that gas plant district, but for the all of Pinellas County. And because there are people who need affordable housing, not just there, mm -hmm. but up here as well. So it's, it's, it is uh, related to advocates because we need to advocate for all of Pinellas County. And it's like the 
the statement we made with PSTA and the free sun runner. So there are those issues that I think the advocacy committee can address. And, and so I, I think as we finish up this agenda item, we're in agreement that we do want an advocacy committee. We do want to look at the charter requirements for joining or um, a quorum that makes it easier for that committee to operate. Uh, and then that committee will report back to our COC board um, and we'll figure out um, a sequence for their statements and how those would approved and sent out either through the COC advocacy committee or the HLA. And some people did mention that the HLA is less uh, prone to you know, retribution. And I would agree with that. I would prefer them to have those statements. <clears throat> Even as elected officials, there's retribution when we have, when we ask for um, approach appropriations and other things that are going on in our city that you know we can get flagged for. Uh, let me just say it's not, you know, we're not all powerful and immune from any kind of um, pushback as elected officials. So anything final about um, advocacy, we'll move on to some committee reports. I, I just want to ask one thing. So Lieutenant Hinch, are you, are you all having like weekly meetings preparing for this legislation? So there's been discussion the last week since the, there was a discussion, uh, what day was that? What day did you send that out, Victoria? Tuesday? When, Monday, Tuesday? I, Press release? Monday, I want to say. Yeah. So we've been having discussions since Monday, um, obviously, as it makes its way, I'm okay. sure there will be yeah. further discussions, you know, as of, as of right now, I'm not aware of it further, anything further than what we had the last three days, two days, three days. Okay, fantastic. <clears throat> we'll move on to the council and committee updates. So <clears throat> I'll start with the funders council. Um, <clears throat> a really important council. Uh, it provides funds for all of our uh, organizations from um, our funding partners. Uh, we do not still have a chair or vice chair or secretary for funders council. So I led that funders council meeting. <clears throat> we had it on February 23rd. We had great attendance. Um, we talked about the fact that providers do not want a joint funders providers council to have it merged. Uh, providers want to have their own meetings, which are fine. Um, and the funders are, um, happy with having four joint meetings uh, with providers council throughout the year. And then funders have a, they had their own meeting on February 23rd. And they'll have another one on December uh, 12th, I think it was, December 13th um, would work. Um, and they can talk about uh, priorities. Um, we talked about workflow and having a letter sent much earlier than it was um, this year, in, in, uh, earlier this week, about what the priorities are from the COC for funding. And I know it was discussed but not finalized on letterhead that uh, family shelter is the number one priority. So hopefully those funder groups uh, are aware of that and they confirmed that they were aware of that, but they do have an official letter now as we go into budgeting. But we talked about workflow and when to have, start to have those conversations about HMIS data, what does it show, what are our priorities, and where are we going to communicate to our funders um, uh, that, that they want to prioritize in their budget cycles. Um, and also <laughs> talked about the funders charter and trying to, uh, once we do get a funders chair and vice chair, uh, uh, and this will, you know, come along with our HLA CEO, Daisy Carrera, who is set to start March 25th, March 25th, uh, which will be exciting, um, that the funders chair or charter can be modified to allow for some flexibility about the chair of the funders council, what needs he or she uh, actually needs to be at, uh, and can they have a designee do maybe general membership to lighten that load. Uh, so that was received well. Um, graciously and thankfully, um, my friend uh, and Clearwater representative uh, Chuck Lane 
from our housing and economic development is going to serve as a liaison only, just as a communicator between uh, HLA, DAISY, and the Funders Council. Um, and so I appreciate that very much. Errol Woodard, who also is phenomenal with the city of Largo and has great institutional knowledge. She's going to talk with her city about um, the possibility of her taking some leadership roles, maybe through, you know, chair and vice chair. So there's hope there. We also talked about uh, expanding um, representation with the funders, uh, maybe some chambers, uh, healthcare, uh, and other organizations. Um, and they also talked about uh, alignment, um, getting some guidance from HUD um, TAs about alignment because different municipalities are getting some different um, feedback about HUD requirements and what's approved, approval process and all those uh, requirements. And their discussion was uh, that they would agree on some of those key areas as a group and then they ask for guidance from the HUD uh, technical assistance that a lady gave. And then finally, um, we talked about the workflow. Oh, and then um, Karen Yatchum mentioned that she she talked about the collab uh, interlocal agreement. So she's going to send that out. It's not something that I was familiar with, but certainly it needs to be more fully funded and. Um, and so we're going to look, look at that. And um, anybody else check in thing? Yeah, on the alignment issue, one of the things we're talk we've talked about, and I've had it for a long time, um, is to try to get some consistency among the jurisdictions and, and the stuff we require with reporting and our, our applications. You know, we all use the same application system, but our applications look different, and there's really no need for that. And um, so we have meetings scheduled try to coordinate those things to make it easier easier on our funder, on our, on our, on our providers. Um, so that's common. We do we can kind of slow up sometimes. Um uh, we're so grateful that the, that you're taking up that uh issue. Uh if you remember correctly at one of our very first joint provider funders, uh we came to a list of topics that we all agreed to, providers and funders. This was one of those things. One of the complexities to make sure that you include, one of the complexities on the issue, uh, in addition to what you just articulated, is that usually with these funding sources, and I'm gonna make it up, usually with these CDBG and ESG and HUD and whatever, all the, all the funding sources that we're talking about, there is usually a list, and I'm gonna make it up, of 17 things that can be considered an allowable uh, expense or, you know, a, a, a funded service kind of thing. And so one of the challenges that providers have seen is that the city of Clearwater picks, you know, four of those 17. The city of St. Pete picks a different four of those 17. The city of Largo picks, yet again, a, you know, four different ones. And so in addition to streamlining kind of the application, the reporting and those kinds of things, if, if they are different priorities then that are being funded in those particular municipalities, it makes it difficult <clears throat> to kind of get the, the groundswell, so to speak, of you know, the outcomes that we're looking for as a community at, at large. But this is an issue that, that both the Funders Council and the Providers Council agreed to. It was one of the top, top lists. We have, and I, I can't remember the exact number that was discussed that day, but we have five different HUD reps, for example, in Pinellas County. So Largo's HUD rep is different than Clearwater's HUD rep, which is different than, and so what, what Chuck was able to get the HUD rep to agree to, for example, which was revolutionary, if you remember correctly, uh, around people living homeless, we couldn't get that same, we couldn't get that same um, commitment from other HUD reps, right? And so it's gonna be, it, so that's a good thing. Can I just ask though, so with with Chuck serving as a liaison, what, what was the reason that Chuck couldn't, is there a reason Chuck that you couldn't take the chair? I'm, I'm contemplating that. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a big commitment. Okay. You know, um, okay. so we, we better discuss it. That's something I'm that Okay. <clears throat> it's really around the, the commitment of, of time versus it that is, there's a reason it, why you can't. It also seems to be kind of working towards divvying up some of, the, some of that responsibility. 
so it's not all put on the chair, which might make it useful. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Um, Providers Council update. All right. Providers Council met also on the 23rd. Um, uh, much like the meeting today, uh, we spent a large amount of time discussing Senate Bill 1530, HB 1365, which I will not uh, summarize again. Uh, uh, right here. Uh, I would say the second largest amount of our time was actually spent discussing a uh, recent incident that happened at HEP. Um, Ashley Lowry is the CEO there. And um, yeah. Uh, uh, founder, the founder. Oh, uh, Barbara Green. Yeah, Barbara Green. she came as well. Uh, they had great concerns because they had a um, a teenager that was um, shot and killed on uh, one of their properties, and the discussion centered around our screening process, our assessment process, giving the uh, continuum of care. Just, we kind of had just sort of a lengthy discussion on. Um, uh, what could we do differently as a system to potentially um, uh, capture some of those concerns, um, mostly from the perspective of ensuring that if there are some uh, uh, risks involved in a particular person, that we uh, utilize our partnerships as providers to um, provide those additional services. Because in the situation that happened with PEP, there was some... There was no prediction of what was going to happen was going to happen, uh, but there was some information about this particular teenager that there was some trouble with the law and that this family was, um, you know, complex and would need a lot of uh, additional support and care. And had there been, and there was some case uh, we did dig in, and there was some case communication going back and forth between because they they were in rapid rehousing through H. Through I think it was through FHAP. Yeah. Through FHAP, and uh, they were not doing. They lost their housing. were not doing well. So this was sort of a transfer to HEP. Um, but we felt maybe the transfer of knowledge was more a little bit maybe a little bit more transactional. Didn't get into the the, the details of it, and had uh, maybe more conversation occur, we might have um, you know put additional services around that family. You know. Uh, we all kind of recognize that even doing that, you can't ever predict these things that were going to happen, but we just wanted to strive for doing the best job that we could as providers to, um, you know, ensure that, you know, our individuals and families get the best services that are available. Because sometimes we all have run programs and we may not be aware of them. Um, and in this case, I think, you know, April had a program that, you know, if this family had been in school and the kids were in school, she's like, I could have, I could have had my staff with that family. That conversation never had happened. Uh, so we're just kind of committed to going back to those of these conferences. Anything else missing about that? I can just let you know that um, Karen's already reached out and you have follow-up and we can get all the teams together look through all the notes and all the staffings that did happen around the family just to see if there's any place we can identify that there could have been gap. Those two things took a majority of the meeting. Uh, we did discuss briefly the the, the, the the joint priorities between the Providers and Funders Council, which we just discussed, and, and, um, and kind of, well, we have a subcommittee set aside to, for the Providers Council to kind of be prepared for our next uh, joint meeting in April. Um, and then the, the rest of the meeting, uh, we we got uh, we have some Victoria give us a good overview of the point in time um, and uh, some of the initial preliminary data on that and some of the observations that we had as a result of that. And then we went through all of our HMS policies and procedures um, for for move forward. Thank you very much. And you know, I think speaking for me as well as the funders always find those joint meetings incredibly informative and meaningful but keep an eye on the screen um data and system performance sam got it so we're uh the committee we're looking at a couple of different ways to present data that are going to be more useful i think we want to get back to a cadence of presenting overall data regularly to the board because we want to be data informed 
But one of the continuing struggles is that our data has a lot of noise in it. And so a lot of what we've presented in the past is basically any quarter could be a different quarter, give or take 5% of anything. And, it, and so it, it shows us what is, but it doesn't really show us much that's actionable. So we want to get a, a better uh, handle on what we can do that's actionable with that. Overall, uh, last quarter that ended at the end of the calendar year, uh, total client inflow was down 17%. It's about 1,000 people coming into, new people coming into homelessness in a quarter. Um, 881 clients exited to unknown, which was 41% uh, of our total exits. So still a lot of unknown. And then there's another big category of other that looks like that might be a, effectively a proxy for unknown also. So um, there's a lot of people that we still don't know what is happening with. Um, looking at client serve, it's a whole different scale. That's about 55,000, 5,500 a month that we're serving. Uh, so about 15,000 a quarter that we're serving. 44% um, of that is through permanent housing pro projects, particularly permanent supportive housing. And those people are there. So it's like the same 1,300 people are served in permanent supportive housing all the time. That's a chunk. And then a number of people, 36% served in emergency shelters and, and other temporary projects. Street outreach increased its service over the same quarter last year by 21%, serving um, almost 1,800 people last quarter. So that's that's great. Um, right now, it takes an average of 112 days for a RAP rehousing client to move into housing. So that's sort of a key data point overall. We know housing is a challenge in Pinellas County. We've talked about that a lot. We continue to... Um, and then the good news is 82% of the clients that are served in rapid rehousing exit to permanent housing. So it is an effective uh, intervention. Uh, I, I would say provisionally that some of the data we're going to look at in the next few quarters is going to suggest that we probably need a lot more rapid rehousing funding in our system. That is, um, you know, if you just think about the way a uh, continuum of care works, the most effective way to get a lot of people housed is rapid rehousing. There's a place for permanent supportive housing. Um, actually, compared to a, we need more permanent supportive housing, but compared to a lot of our neighboring COCs, we're actually we have much more permanent supportive housing than a lot of our our local. Thank you, Wally. <laughs> uh, and we know that's a very effective intervention for people who need that. Rapid rehousing in terms of serving garden variety people who become homeless, that is the, that needs to be a cornerstone in, in a homeless system of care because it can house people relatively quickly if we do it effectively. So that's a, that feels like a real area. I could just chime in on yeah. that just with the funding and the timing mm -hmm. schedule that we're having. It's like, you know, it looks like we have, we have to get our timing on this. Because mm -hmm. I, I, I have in two weeks, I've been an application for mm -hmm. a new housing development. And if, if there's not a commitment or a need here within the homeless community to mm -hmm. uh, buy that, make that housing for the homeless population, then I'm, it's going to go to another population. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, it's just the, the way that the timing works. You know, and I, mm -hmm. I get the application in two weeks. I have four, five boxes to check <laughs> of right. subpopulation. Yeah. Once I check those boxes, I can't go back and say, right. no, I didn't mean that box. I meant right. this box. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, you know, now that project will be two years from now. But right. I have to know now, um, is there going to be commitment dollars for that project yeah. for the homeless population? Mm -hmm. So those are the challenging things that we have to have. No, that's absolutely right. And I and I guess I would say as a comment about how we do business in general here, I think we have some opportunities to dig deeper and more operationally in some things. I mean, obviously, Providers Council does a lot of that. But I think where the real strength of a continuum of care is, is the ability to have everybody at the table occasionally mm -hmm. The challenge is a lot of our funding is is short term anyway, so we have to do year by year based on based on NOFO and other annual funding. Um, you know, potentially that would be a topic for an advocacy committee to think about what county and state funding that we have regularly could we get on a two to five year cycle. Yeah, you know, and how, how can we how can we right. you know I think that's an that's an area to think about, but I think mm -hmm. we need to do a good job synchronizing those things so that Kevin can have guidance about what to what to apply for and that we can make a commitment as a continuum of care mm -hmm. to support those projects. And so we can, I mean, so we can think about how, what is all the funding that we're looking at that we 
that we not only direct fully, but also what do we influence and how do we guide other people to, to use the funding in a way that's most effective? Mm -hmm. And then the third piece is how do we mobilize more philanthropic private funding mm -hmm. in our community? As we saw at the beginning of the meeting, there's a lot of generosity within Pinellas County. Uh, most of it is not channeled through the COC. And, and I think there are some opportunities there. I, I suspect that there are a lot of organizations and wealthy private citizens who would be excited to make investments in ending homelessness mm -hmm. if they knew they were doing it through a body that was broadly representative like ours is and effective in managing resources. One little data point, I know we've got to get moving away. We had a housing study done for uh, the city of Clearwater that was presented at the end of January by S.B. Friedman, I think. And um, they used a county as a comparator, but then they narrowed down on Clearwater. And um, for the county, we have a net increase of 35 people every single day. Every single day, net increase. So that means births, deaths, people moving, people moving in and out. But we are 35 plus every single day. To me, it was like, wow, where are they going? Who are they and where are they going? It's, it's, um, it's really a, a, a striking number. Okay. Uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Do we have a report from that? Teresa, Teresa was going to do it, but she had to leave. Okay. So I, I did attend the last meeting, so I can okay. um, speak to that a little bit. Um, the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee, um, as you may know, has lost their chair. Um, family promise is no more. So Dennis has had to resign um, as he moves on with his career. Um, so diversity, equity, and inclusion started meeting again um, just a couple of weeks ago. Um, they meet on the third Tuesday of the month in Allendale, right? Y'all are Thursday at DMP, right? Okay, I always get those confused. The third Tuesday of the month at Allendale at 9 a.m. Um, I believe that they will be looking at possible new locations and whatnot to try and help with some forum issues from the past. Um, they are searching for a chair. Dr. Susie Patterson with the Foundation for Healthy St. Pete is the vice chair. Um, she feels as though I, somebody else might serve better as chair though. So they are looking for somebody to step in as chair. And they are also looking for ways to make a meaningful impact over the next year. Um, the ACLU did do a presentation for them a while ago, and that is a presentation that can be brought to this board um, through Dr. Patterson, um, or if the board prefers, it's something that we can maybe schedule at another time so that more providers can attend. Um, but the presentation that the ACLU gave the DEI committee was largely or really all about how to advocate um, in the face of current legislation and that fear that we have discussed um, earlier in this meeting. Um, so uh, that can be either brought to the entire board or a separate meeting as the board prefers. I think um, it's, so yeah, any feedback on that? Or would you like, how long of a presentation was it? A half hour? Or? I think it was around a half hour. I must confess, I was not at that meeting. It was last year, I was not okay. there, but I think it was around a half an hour. Yeah, I think it would be. Mm -hmm. How about membership meeting? The next membership meeting? I think that'd be a great draw for that. That's fantastic. Okay. Go I ahead. will get with TV. Lee is the new HLA liaison for that committee. So you, you might see emails from her, be on the lookout, but I will get with her and Dr. Patterson about scheduling that for the April meeting. And I think there was also some talk about quorum for that committee yeah. as well. So we're looking at changing, doing um, yeah. amendments to the charter for quorum. And then Michael, lived experience? Yeah, so you know, just the usual. We got the charter approved. Uh, we had elections. Um, myself and my housemate, Wayne, we were elected co chairs of that committee. But we elected a secretary. Uh, some of us participated in the uh, collaborative meeting last month for the street outreach team mm -hmm. and see. Uh, I'd like to think that going forward will provide some good insight. And uh, one of the things that got me about the committee is uh, 
So I've got a focus, but it's something we got to pinpoint on uh, not advocacy or anything, but responsibilities to see uh, if we're actually doing the things we need to do to help people who have had lived experience and project that to the committee so that ideas and plans for the future take that into account, not just the theoretical things that we've been discussing for like adversary, but the actual practical things. Uh, who what in terms of location or uh, where places that might be set up for like uh, affordable housing or uh, what I used to do when it was at St. PD, the village of tiny homes sort of thing. Those are practical little steps uh, that might relieve some of the pressure on a lot of folk, which I used to be a guest there, so I understand that it's not it's not ideal. And it's still it's still not um it's a far it's a far way away from this group. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We gotta keep that's why I guess the lived experience of ISAB committee exists. Yeah. So it's not we're all not far away from uh people who have been there. I mean, in theory, just about any of us, if you're a couple paychecks away from having to sleep on a friend's couch, or worse. Mm -hmm. And we got to make sure that most, if not all the things we discuss, including uh, the advocacy part we were talking a lot about today, remember that we're advocating for people who are on the street, yes. and for people who are just barely making it, Little cup surfing or are they under the ropes of uh, their uh, financial support, that sort of thing. And that's something I just want to keep everybody in mind. That's one of the reasons I'm here. And that's something I'd like to make sure uh, you'll know if anybody has any questions for the advisory committee or uh, just let us know. Let me know. Let me know. Um, see if we can actually collaborate and do some. Good this next year. Thank you. Yeah. Michael, have you guys as a as the advisory committee? I know that you're you know you're you're just forming some of those things, but have you had the conversation about this legislative action that's going to be taking place? Like, does the lived experience advisory committee have a position? Have you discussed a position? You know what we heard Amy say right, uh, a, a bit ago, is that there are, in fact, people who are living homeless right now on the streets who who are organizing to, in fact, sue. And so have you heard that? Is the Lived Experience Advisory Committee hearing that? <laughs> uh, yes and no. Um, we only have about seven actual uh, consistent members we need more and yes we are there are people who on the committee who are reaching out for people who are told to come to our meetings to, so we can help them so they can hear from them so we can actually get some because it's been a little while since i've actually been with us mm -hmm. uh i was at safe harbor when i found uh, the job at walmart which i'm still at and uh and found a place through community foundation services so it's been a few years, but you don't forget. But oh, no. what happens now with people, it, it's different from then what it was five years ago. Sure, yeah. So you're right. Uh, I wish we had more members to give more actual, actionable uh, insights uh, just beyond what I experienced, but what are people have now out on the street? And we got a few people who I wish were here, which can go to these meetings like a, like in Clearwater, but they got transportation issues. They get, and that's one of those things I, I pointed out uh, in the last meeting, and they pointed out to me in the last meeting, they can't go to some of this. They're they going to make it to the um, uh, the street outreach meeting because they couldn't leave their stuff. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's, it's the little things like that that I think we need to remember. You know. Yeah, I agree with you, Michael, so very much. Actually, I agree with everything that you just said. I wonder, in the absence of advocacy groups, though, right, which is going to take a minute, 
is if we can't support and or help our lived experience advisory council to you know convene somehow maybe at safe harbor at pinellas hope at you know we're, we're at grand central station for example at the grand central station um to begin uh hearing the voice of what is their position it, i'm hearing right that the, the people on the streets where you heard amy say right they're they're mobilizing and they know the law and they know what's coming down the pike and these kinds of things it's like i wonder if we couldn't help you know shape their position right so we're not eventually at odds <laughs> right that we're doing something that is against what they're trying to do which is is my my what i think i'm hearing right now is the position that we're trying to take um is in fact at odds with the position that that people who are living homeless currently are attempting to take michael do you have somebody on the advisory committee that works somebody that's also on the lived experience that's part of the advisory committee at all? Yeah. Or I mean, not advisory, ad advocacy committee? Mm -hmm. Here, I've been here, Wayne, I wish he was here, but he had already to be mentioned there were a couple of ladies oh, that were here as well. Okay. We need to open it up more, but yeah. I need to get more people to actually be here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's not as easy as, yeah. Uh, as it seems to find, hey, right. someone on the street, hey, you want to go to the committee? <laughs> <laughs> and then from there, I just passed someone coming here. Well, on all the grand owners, they had a basket for their full of yeah. stuff. That's all the stuff they did. I think, but, you know, yeah, people, it's, it's not easy yeah. getting more people to get right. the ideas right. uh, from them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wonder if we can go to we that try. and do, you know, we, I have a person who comes and uses her three minutes and she has an iPad that she records things on. And so she's got a video that she'll use of, you know, different things, but you could, we could do something like that with going to your group or others and taking their, a statement, you know, 30 second statement, put five or six of them together. And we um, meet monthly, so we'll definitely bring that up uh, this yeah. month's meeting so we can yeah. get some concrete ideas. Right. That Cause even I have like, a good idea of where we're trying to lean towards in terms of the CUC meetings mm -hmm. and what you want. Mm -hmm. So I think we can come up with some good stuff uh, for uh, meeting um, uh, again in May, I think. Yeah. yeah. Fourth yeah. Thursday of the month at Pinellas Park Library at 5 30 p.m. It's fourth Thursday of the month, 5 30 p.m. in all Park Library. Because we should go see me. We'll yeah. definitely have some, something to help paper to help out, mm -hmm. if not actual deep theater. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have any public comment? Do we have anybody online? No public comment online? No, not yet. All right. Any final thoughts? Anybody want to weigh in on anything? All right. So uh, uh, Daisy Correa will be here March 25th, and it'll be wonderful to have a new leader. Uh, I hope to be here uh, in March at the next meeting. We'll see how all that goes. Um, we'll need to, we're going to talk at our executive committee meeting that's next um, about any kind of succession plans. I'm up for uh, election in Clearwater and our election is March 19th. Um, if I'm not here in this position, I will join as a general member and be part of sitting over, you know, next to Teresa <laughs> and uh, and continuing the work. Um, but I thank you all for being here and uh, yeah. I, I just want, it just came on, I'm so sorry. Uh, I got an email this week that um, Blue Sky Community, they develop a, a yeah. affordable housing in St. Petersburg. They have a new place, I think it's 85 unit that's opening up called Bear Creek Commons. Yeah. Um, and I think they're trying to, I, I think it's almost finished and they're trying to gather applications. So I've asked them to send me any promotional materials that they might have so that I can uh, distribute that not only to our voucher holders, but also to our partners here at COC. So once I get that, I'll be sure to share that. But yeah, they're looking to uh, build up their wait list so that they can fill those units. Um, I, I think again, affordable housing. I think it might be a tax credit property. So yeah, it's 80%. 80%. The, 
We're in the 80s usually. Yeah. So, um, but hopefully the promotional materials will have those details that I can share. Yeah. Sorry about that. No, that's a text me to request some information about that right now. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Hello. Okay. Um, if you don't mind. Um, motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. All right. Hello. Thank you all. Thank you very much for coming. We'll see you at the next meeting. And thank you for your important work. Thank you. Yeah, he's not here. You're right, Kirk. Yeah, I'll